You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your black and white host, Abraham. And I'm your not quite a whale host, Shane. We're a psychology podcast. We like to talk about what people and animals will sometimes do and why they do it and how they do it and under the circumstances circumstances under which they do it. I said that right? Kind of? Yeah, mostly. <laughs> and yeah, we've covered, I mean, so many topics. This is just so much fun and we just keep going and it's great. And we're here now to talk about something that's been happening recently in the news. This is sort of a like developing story type story, uh-huh. but also it stretches back further than people might think. Yes. And so today we are talking about orca behavior. Now, as somebody who grew up in Florida, I have a particular fascination with sea life and marine biology. I was going to be a marine biologist before I got into behavior analysis. You know, sea world's right down the road. I live near the beach. Like I was always kind of thought this stuff was really fascinating. But one thing that always kind of put me on edge was orcas because they were so big. Sure. And this episode didn't do them any favors. I mean, they make them (laughs) likable, but also they're still very scary. Sure. Yeah, I can see that. And before we get into talking about orcas, I would like to let everyone know if you finish this episode and you like what you heard and you're like, I would like to support this show, then one thing one thing that you can do is you can just subscribe. You can leave a rating and a review. Those are easy, cheap, relatively not time consuming things that help us out and we appreciate them so much. So please go do that. Other things that you can do include that you can join us on Patreon where you get access to behind the scenes content and I'll go over all of that toward the end. You can also pick up some merch at our merch store, which certainly helps us out. We got shirts and beanies and all kinds of things. And then, of course, you can start a organization to help save the orcas and call it Why We Do What We Do Orca Saviors or something. Yeah. WWD, WWD OS. <laughs> yes. And we'll talk more about all of those things at the end of today's discussion. Um, and another important thing to note before we get into it. So just we're just kind of teasing all the things, all the Orca things that we'd like to talk about is that this episode comes out July 19th. Yes. And so we like to celebrate. And today is National Hot Dog Day. So uh, or Veggie Dog Day. Go celebrate a veggie dog instead. There you go. It's also National Daiquiri Day, which you compare with Hot Dog Day, I suppose. That sounds tasty. It's also National Urban Beekeeping Day, so that's fun. Put bees in your apartment. (laughs) (laughs) It is Air Conditioning Appreciation Days, which is kind of, I think, the months of June, July, August, and maybe September in much of the United States, but, you know. Yes, 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 yes. Also, in a surprising bout of serendipity, synchronicities, all that fun stuff, it is Shark Week. Yeah. This is Shark Week. So, you know, uh, go protect sharks. In relation to that, I guess, is that it's everybody deserves a massage week with a, <laughs> by a shark, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be careful. It's also National Zookeeper Week, which is really nice for the folks that are taking care of those animals. For those of you who are celebrating Hot Dog Day, it is Horseradish Month, and some people like to pair those. That's a, a long time to celebrate that condiment, I feel like. An entire month. <laughs> it does month. feel like they would have those switched. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Shouldn't it be National Hot Dog know. Month and Horseradish Day? I don't know. It's also National Bison Month. Awesome. And Wild About Wildlife Month. As you can tell, because there's a lot about animals, I feel like, yeah. in this month and in this uh, episode. We're celebrating all the things. So I guess you can go get a hot dog with some horseradish in your air conditioning. If you are outside, get a daiquiri to cool down once you come back inside into your air conditioning. After you've gotten your massage, while Shark Week plays in the background and and you do some kind of activism around bison to protect them from people going to touch them and mauling them. Yeah, while hanging out with your bees. Yeah, your bees. I for, don't forget the bees. Get some. Get your your bees some daiquiris. <laughs> they might enjoy that to some extent. At least, yeah. I'm not sure how bees do with alcohol in general, but the the sugary part of it, they'd be all about it. I can almost guarantee that there is a study somewhere where bees drank alcohol. That is a good point. I know that that's happened. <laughs> yeah, scientists, that scientists, so some scientists was like, you know what? We should get bees drunk. And then that turned into a research question. <laughs> yeah. Scientists love to get animals drunk and high. That is definitely a thing that has happened in the past. <laughs> and continues to happen. <laughs> and continues to happen. And speaking of animals getting drunk and high, we are talking about this amazing gigantic black and white creature that lives in the ocean that you've seen on the news that was the star of a a movie called Free Willy and a documentary called Blackfish. And these are are the illustrious orcas. 
Yes. So in this episode, we are going to figure out what hats, burping, great white sharks, and menopause all have in common. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> and this is partially inspired by the fact that orcas have been in the news a lot lately, because in the past few years, they've been uh, attacking boats, and it made us wonder about other orca behaviors and the boat attacking behavior, and what does orca behavior actually look like? Yeah, so what you're going to discover in this episode, I think, is that uh, orcas are really complex and unique social creatures. And um, I, I had a lot of fun putting the notes together for this one because, I, I, you know, you think you know some things and then you learn a whole bunch of new things and it changes your worldview. It's wonderful. Absolutely. And I do think this one is going to be on the shorter end just because I think there's it's sort of fairly straightforward. We know the things that we know and there's a lot that we unfortunately don't know, but it'll be interesting and fun to unpack these because there's a lot of new stuff in here for me. And I always love learning new things. That's why I like to host a podcast. Yeah, uh, it's why we do what we do. <laughs> Beautiful. We did it. <laughs> we said the thing. Let's go in and, and dive into a little bit of background about these these majestic creatures. Now, the killer whale, the Orcanus orca, is a toothed whale species that is actually more closely related to dolphins and other whale species. And it's sometimes referred to as the blackfish or as Grampus, though Grampus is not used quite as often so it's actually a dolphin and not a whale which i think is really kind of fascinating and that's mind-blowing fact number one orca whales are not whales yes yeah exactly right so the term orcanus means the kingdom of the dead actually so that's <laughs> in their name the orcanus orca kingdom of the dead <laughs> in there, so, which is kind of crazy. So crazy. <laughs> so scary. Yeah. So for those unfamiliar with the species, they are characterized by their black and white patterning, which is what I was describing as why yeah. I'm your black and white host, which is especially helpful for hiding in the ocean. Their dorsal or back patterning is a deep black. It's very, very black. While their ventral part of their body, which is their belly, is a bright white. And this actually serves to make them difficult to see from above, because in contrast with the water and the ocean floor, Having them be black means it's difficult to see them. And then from below, it's difficult to see them because of the white contrasting against the bright white that is the surface of the ocean, the sky, and the sun, and that sort of thing. So it's kind of almost like a natural bit of camouflage in a way. Right, which is you know really fascinating to think of something so large having camouflage. Uh, I think that's really like, yeah. kind of a unique thing. Now, there are some orcas that are classified as a type C type of patterning that have grayscaling, which uh, is slightly different than what you are used to or what you normally see. And they look really, really cool when you can look them up and see them. It's it's a very unique look. It's kind of jarring if you're not if you're used to the kind of black and white patterning that you see with orcas already. And then, you know, one of the things that always strikes me is they have the sort of one of the white spots that's kind of around where their eyes are. It almost kind of looks like they're like cutouts for eyes, if you yeah. will, like they're wearing a big black mask or something that happens to cover their whole body. Yeah. Cowl, if you will. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's they're really they're really cool looking. Yeah. Now, regarding their size, they range anywhere from 20 to 26 feet in length, which is around... Oh, seven to nine ish meters for our metric friends. And they can weigh up to 6.6 6 short tons or American tons. Yeah. If you will. So over 12,000 pounds. I learned something during this episode that there are short tons and long tons. Huh? Who knew? Yeah. Didn't like that. They also have really good eyesight above and below water. They have great hearing and a good sense of touch. So they're incredibly sensitive creatures as well. And they have, they have an incredibly sophisticated echolocation sense, even compared to other dolphin and whale species. So, uh, so they are essentially primed to, to be able to be the best hunters in the ocean, that they're set up to have really great touch, really great eyesight, really great echolocation, really great hearing. I mean, everything works really well for them. Yeah, and most of the ecosystems where they exist, they seem to be apex predators, meaning that nothing hunts them. They hunt everything else. That even includes sharks, for a reason we'll get into a little bit later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they are, they're huge, they're fast, they're very smart, they're very well-equipped to dispatch with foes and food alike very quickly. Yes. So they have evolved to fill a niche, very, a very particular niche, very, very well. And so they are, are really not, there's not a lot of matches for an orca out in the water when you're out there. 
Right. So most of the species lives in the Southern Ocean where the water is cooler and dense with other species that they hunt, including seals and penguins. That's mostly that's their, their primary food source. They have a wide range in terms of geographic location compared to other species. However, what we find is that they are they are actually found all over the world, not just colder waters, but mostly colder waters is where they are. Like that's where you're going to find the majority of these the, the pods that, that exist. So as we're saying, because they are these expert hunters and these apex predators, they're sometimes called the wolves of the sea because of how they hunt. And for those who are familiar with wolves, wolves hunt in packs. And so orcas will often hunt in these pods and they can swim at about 35 miles per hour in these little packs that they hunt in. And their techniques include a variety of really interesting behaviors, such as beaching themselves and their prey safe haven. They'll go up onto beaches. <laughs> yeah. So like they'll, they'll even chase their prey onto beaches because oftentimes the prey will think like, just get out of the water and then I'll be fine. And then the orca just comes right out of the water with them. <laughs> <laughs> Which has got to be horrifying. Imagine like being chased by something that's only in the water. You get up on land and you're like, good, I'm safe. And it walks out of the water after you. Like, no thanks. Yeah, exactly. That's what this thing does. Yes. And, and I'll actually add a little bit more on that. I hope I remember to come back to you. They also will circle us around their prey. And then because we mentioned they, they often swim in colder waters and they are often... One of the things they really like to eat as seals mm-hmm. is they'll break up ice sheets where the prey may be hiding so that then sort of force them into the water. There are some really cool videos that you can see of a pack of orcas chasing this one seal. The, the seal is on like kind of an ice sheet like in, in the Arctic. And you see these four orcas swim in a line underneath the sheet and just wreck the entire sheet. They just break it up into small chunks so the seal basically has nowhere to go but into the water where they're at. It's really impressive to watch it's like an aerial view of it and it looks really really i mean it's it's nature so you know it's brutal yeah. but it is a really really interesting thing to see these four orcas together just say hey guys okay we're gonna we're gonna mess this up uh here we go uh and just like just <laughs> demolish the sheet that the seal is on wow it's scary i mean it's 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 scary to watch you go i'm so glad that they don't eat humans yeah. because if they did we wouldn't have we wouldn't stand a chance there's no way yeah <laughs> which we'll get to later Now, there are about 50,000 orcas worldwide, according to best estimates, and with more recent conservation efforts, it is expected that the population will continue to climb, which is, you know, that's one thing that we're going to come back to SeaWorld multiple times, but one thing that SeaWorld did was they brought a lot of awareness to orcas that exist in the wild and conservation efforts, and they kind of helped lead a lot of charges around that and, and helped with that kind of movement towards building that population again. Yeah, it's a controversial place for sure, but I think looking at It's one of those things that just requires a nuanced look for all the different things that it did. Yes. But yeah, I mean, 50,000 maybe sounds like a lot, but for a species, that is a very, very low number. Yes. If you can imagine there being only 50,000 humans in the world, that would be like, it would look like the apocalypse here because there would be so few people left. Yeah, that would be half of Daytona. (laughs) There you go. And everybody wants to save half of Daytona. (laughs) At least half. At least half. Uh, The other half can uh, go kick rocks. (laughs) All right. Well, we have some Orca social media to talk about here in a second. (laughs) But first, (laughs) we're going to uh, feed our listeners to the advertising killer whales. (laughs) Okay, let's talk about the influencers of the animal world, the Orca. Yes, so we have talked about them being scary, but orcas are incredibly smart, and they have really complex behavioral repertoires that are worth kind of of diving into, and for the purposes of this episode, that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on all these different things that orcas do, and one of the most important things and most unique things they do is they engage in a lot of play behavior, because remember, I brought this up earlier, they are a dolphin species. They are the largest dolphin species. They are not really a whale species, and so... One characteristic of a lot of dolphin species is they tend to engage in this really complex social play. And orcas have a variety of play behaviors they engage in, and they teach their young these play behaviors. And and they really have no functional kind of benefit except for to engage in social norms, right? Like it's like to engage with other members of the pods. They don't feed them. They don't really do. I mean, they some of the behaviors can kind of like generalize into that, but you'll find that some of it's just really kind of like. It seems like a useless behavior, but it's actually socially important. Right. Kind of like TikTok. (laughs) 
Before we go into some examples, a real quick note. When you used to go to SeaWorld and go to see performances, when if anybody ever did that, you went to go see whale shows or dolphin shows or anything like that, the tricks that they would engage in were actually behaviors. They were reinforcing play behaviors. Or they were rewarding play behaviors most of the time. And there were a lot of different examples of, you know, a, an orca breaching the water and then, you know, splashing everybody, you know, using their tail to, to splash the crowds and all that. Those were examples of play behaviors that were naturally occurring in the orca behavioral repertoire that they figured out how to reward and turn into a show. Yeah. And I think when we were talking about play is thinking about there, you'll see other whales and other sea creatures that will breach. They basically come jumping. They swim so fast, they break the surface of the water and they'll jump out of the water and catch some air. And most of the time when we see that in animals, when we say that this doesn't have a functional purpose for orcas is because they are chasing prey. They are escaping predators or there is some other like reason for them to be doing it like that. We can sort of link back to something that has like immediate survival value in some some sense or another. Right. Uh, I've also seen some whales who do that to protect their young. The like if they breach, then basically they can they can hide their young on their bellies. Right. Is apparently a thing that that they've done, which is kind of cool. But these orcas will do it when none of those things are, are present. They're not avoiding attacks. They're not trying to get food. They seem to be doing it just for the sake of doing it, which is kind of how we would define play. Right. Right. And as you said, that includes things like doing these back dives, belly flops, and breaches. Apparently, one that they're somewhat known for is burping <laughs> blowing yes. bubbles which is really cute and they'll chase each other they'll do these like fin slaps that sort of seem to be like high fives or you yeah. know fist bumps that sort of thing fluke lifts and waves and some some other really fun trends i'll let you take the next one yeah so one thing they do is this thing called kelping and what they'll do is they'll gather seaweed and different types of kelp, and they will drag it around. They'll swim with it on their uh, in the notch of their flukes. So they'll swim with it like in their basically like what you would imagine like their armpits or on the back of their necks. And if you want to like kind of compare it to human anatomy, and that's what they do. They swim around with this stuff, kind of like uh, like almost like costume jewelry. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny. It's so cute. <laughs> it's <laughs> this so idea. cute. And like, it's it's clear that they're doing it for fun because they'd easily get it off them if they didn't want it there. You know, right, they, right. They seem to be trying to keep it in place to like wear it for a little while. Right. Another thing they do is they mate for fun. Orcas, similar to dolphins, have sex for fun. Like they're one of the like the dolphin species is the only other species on the planet just that just has sex for fun. So they do mating. They roll. So that's a thing that they'll do. They roll. And then they also do this thing called spy hopping. And spy hopping is basically they use and they generalize this for hunting as well. But basically, they just kind of if you ever see a video of an orca just popping their head up, up out of the water just a little bit so their eyeball can see above the surface, that's spy hopping. And they'll do that to kind of be like, oh, oh there you are, seals. Oh, penguins. <laughs> there you are. Found you. And then they'll go murder all of them for food. How insidious. <laughs> right. So that's what I'm saying. It's like all of these behaviors are taught as play behaviors, and some of them do turn into functional like survival skills. I do see a potential future episode for us called Sex for Fun, where we talk about this. Uh, how do we know that animals are having sex just for fun? Yeah, we yeah, absolutely. And like which animals do it? Uh-huh. That would be a fun episode. Literally. <laughs> Another thing that orcas do is foraging. So this is kind of interesting. I didn't know that they do this. According to Wright and colleagues in 2017, orcas engage in these minor foraging behaviors. Does this mean that they're going into the forest and getting mushrooms? Of course not. That's not what they're doing. That would be so scary if they did, though. <laughs> I would be, um, I don't know, confused <laughs> if I saw that. <laughs> For multiple reasons. But uh, what researchers have found is that smaller groups will break off from the larger pod in this exploration for food sources. They might dive deeper or swim further away to see if there's more available and densely packed food than where their pod currently is. So they send these little scouting expeditions. But apparently dolphins will also do something similar as this sort of scouting thing where because they also tend to travel in these pods. Yeah. And so then what they'll do is they'll basically like they'll scout out, they'll find like a food source, they'll come back to the pod and then bring the entire pod to this new food source. And again, their geographical locations are really they have a really wide range, like a, a specific pod will cover quite a quite a lot of ground, but they will kind of stay in that same area. They'll return to that area after they've kind of depleted a food source. Wow. Super interesting. Now, they also have really unique social structures and, and unique parenting behaviors. So because they are highly social in nature, and I think this is going to be an important point that we come back to, especially with the controversies that go along with SeaWorld, they are 
incredibly social. And this is actually one of the biggest arguments about kind of the current behaviors around SeaWorld and, and what they were doing. Socialization can occur, but it's limited because the tanks are so small and there are only there are so few of these animals in those tanks. You know, they consider pods between two and 15 orcas, that's kind of like the the general range. But much of their social interaction relies heavily on finding food sources. So if there are kind of ongoing food sources without having to find them, then that eliminates like almost an entire subset of social behavior for them. Sure. And most of the pods are matriarchal, so which is really, really interesting. The older females tend to lead everything. The pods themselves put a lot of emphasis on raising calves. So again, that's another social set of behaviors that gets eliminated if there's only one calf and there's no need to teach the calf survival if it's in captivity. And there are several subgroups within a pod that exchange members to aid in breeding. So like multiple pods will get together and they'll switch members to be able to help with breeding processes. So super fascinating stuff as far as that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then thinking of them as being organized in these sort of matriarchal societies is is kind of unique, uh, it feels like. Not a lot of animal species are organized that way. Hyenas are, actually. Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of fun. And so now getting into, I think, what is part of the impetus for wanting to do this episode in the beginning, which is that orcas seem to pick up fads from one another. Yes. So there, it's it's clear if you have some scouts and like someone comes back and they're like, dude, we found a bunch of fish. And then the whole pod goes that way. There's some meaningful communication that's happening there. And I'm not saying that it's anywhere near as complex or the level that humans are. Maybe it is, but we don't know. And there's just, there's no definitive evidence to say that it definitely is, but it is definitely some kind of functional communication that results in one orca's behavior changing the whole pod of orca's behaviors to then like change direction, go find a particular set of fish. So if they can do something like that, it does stand to reason that we would be able to observe them doing other things like picking up these sort of fads or trends in their behaviors among those in a pod or even across some pods where you have those subgroups, the sort of cross pod lines, if you will. And scientists have actually found that these pods might actually have unique cultures uh, within each pod that, again, extend their play and engagement, which then they sort of share with these other pods. And so let's let's go through some of the interesting things that they found in these these pod cultures, interpod relations, podcast, more pod words. As many pod words that we can put on a podcast, I think, podception, uh, we're all for. So nice. one of the things I, th- I found really fascinating, and I, and I always find languaging really fascinating, uh, like how dialects and yeah. accents and stuff like that work, especially being from the South and how, you know, it's called soda right and people say y'all and then everybody else has it wrong <laughs> i always kind of really appreciate that and then uh, one of the things they found was that pods will have varying communication the communication can change across the regions and it they suggest that pods might actually have unique dialects and accents which makes me laugh so hard thinking about a like a, a an orca that's got like a real southern accent like a real deep southern drawl it's like <laughs> hey man that penguin that i had today was delectable mm. Mm-mm, ooh-wee. <laughs> like, I just want to see an orca talk like that. Uh, and, I, and I love that idea. Right. I heard them sort of describing that you, in all these different pods, you'll hear these sort of clicks and whistles and these sounds that they make that it's really unique that they do uh, through their nasal cavity, interestingly, which is part of why it has a sort of squealing tone that it has. Right. But if they go to another pod, they might hear similar sounds, but they have what, what they described as having an accent to them, just as you were saying. And they they directly compared it to like regional accents in the United States, yeah. like a sort of New Yorker accent versus a Southern accent sort of thing. Which sounds very fun. <laughs> it's so fun. Another thing that they do in these groups is they may share meals, but because they're these sort of unique pods, they might also have certain food preferences. So, for instance, some orcas may prefer salmon or chinook, depending on their region. And another one we'll get to is they might instead be passing around something like a shark, and they'll they'll like take a bite and then pass the carcass to the next one, and they'll <laughs> take a bite, and they just like they share food in this like assembly line buffet thing. Super fascinating. Another thing they they found was the orcas near British Columbia began engaging in a behavior called rubbing beaches, and they would actually find certain like pebbly beach terrains where they would go and they would just rub their bellies along the beach. And it only happened with this one particular pod. They didn't they haven't seen this across other pods. They found this with this one group that would like scratch their bellies along the beach, like almost like a scratching post. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
So this one's really fun. Uh, in Puget Sound, a female orca began carrying a dead salmon around on her nose. And because these are matriarchal societies, a lot of times the the sort of lead female in the group will start the trends. Like she'll, if she starts doing it, then the rest of them will start doing it. And so this one was really fun. I believe this was in around 1996 or so that they were observing this in, in Puget Sound. And as, there was no... As far as I could tell, no reason for it. She just like put a dead salmon on her head and would just swim around with it. <laughs> and within five to six weeks, other orcas from her own pod started also carrying around dead salmon on their heads. They just wear them and just swim around with them. And then other pods that they would interact with started just wearing dead salmon on their head. So it seemed to be almost like a fashion trend <laughs> that they started doing. And again, didn't seem to serve any additional purpose. They just like salmon on head, just swim around. They're like, hey, I like, I like your salmon hat. Yeah, it's. I thought that was so fun when you told me that. I was like, we gotta, we have to talk about this. I need to know about this salmon hat thing. Yeah, which was just so ridiculous. And, and the fact that it, I think, I think it's one thing when it's like, okay, maybe it's like the behavior of a particular organism within the pod, and that's that's maybe that's the thing, and like it's just kind of something they observed. But the fact that it like developed within the pod, yeah. and generalized to other pods, makes me so happy. Yeah, I just thought that was so great. The simple fact of Learning by observation is not something you always consistently find in a lot of other species. A lot of them need direct experience to learn um, from a particular circumstance. So this is taking learning by observation to a whole new level because it's not only learning like an important survival skill. This one seems to be learning a nonsense play-like skill. Yeah. And it's just totally unique. So I, I just think that's sort of fascinating. Do you think that maybe one of the members of the pod saw like the Kentucky Derby and was like, humans wear silly hats. We can do that, too. Probably. Yeah, I hope so. This is something I didn't include in the notes, but around 1999 as well, they found that orcas in the uh, in the New England that were kind of like in the northeast of the United States in those areas where it was a little bit colder, started wearing jinkos and wearing backwards red hats and got really into Limp Biscuit for a minute. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> it was a real strange time, which leads us to actually the orcas near Spain and Portugal, which is the whole, like you mentioned, this was like one of the things that made me want to uh, look at orca behavior is these orcas near Spain and Portugal actually started attacking boats or um, as Fred Durst puts it, they started breaking stuff. <laughs> and with these attacks increasing over the past several weeks, we thought it would be really fun to kind of dive in to this particular fad, this new fad around orcas, which is these boat attacks. Yeah, and they really hadn't been attacking boats before. So this seemed like the reason it was making the news is because people were like, why is this happening all of a sudden? And why does it keep happening? And why is it happening like in these specific places? And that seems to be spreading and all of that. And so let's hear the advertisers try and sell you a boat that may or may not get attacked by orcas. Maybe it's an orca proof <laughs> boat. And then we'll come back and, and talk about what's going on with these boat attacks. Welcome back. If you would like orca proofing for your boat, please use the code why we do what we do boat safe uh, and you can uh, <laughs> make sure that the orcas don't uh, breach your hull. Yeah. <laughs> so many letters. So and many syllables. letters. Oh, God. But it's worth it. It's worth it to save your hide. Yeah. You know, that 5% discount that you get from using our promo code. <laughs> orca proofing for your hulls. <laughs> So this is a, this is a question that's been asked is is why the boats why of all the new fads does this like kind of new aggressive behavior seem to be kind of picking up and on an increasing trend over the last over the last few years even so let's talk about this and and this is actually really fascinating so this is not a new thing this has been happening for the past three years but it's been increasing over the last several weeks at the time of this recording yeah orcas in the iberian peninsula have been attacking many boats ramming them and breaking off parts of their boats like their motors and their rudders and if you know anything about boats these are important for steering and moving if you are in water if you don't have a rudder and if you don't have a motor you might have a hard time getting around sails are great but most of these boats yeah. don't have sails yeah you're mostly just floating there <laughs> Yes, with, they've had to do things. like rescue missions. They've had to send people out to get tow boats in, like to bring them back in. Yeah, and so when I said this is new, what I meant is in the history of relations between humans and orcas, they're not known for attacking boats yes. historically. But in the last few years, this has been happening. And as you said, increasing in the last uh, several weeks relative to the date of this recording at the time. So everyone's sort of wondering why. Why are they breaking these boats? Why are they attacking these boats? And at the time that we're recording this, no one's really been able to determine 
what the purpose may be. Scientists really haven't been able to figure this out. It doesn't seem like it is related to hunting or mating behaviors. There has been several hypotheses that have been floated out, pun intended, about uh, <laughs> what might be going on here. One is that it's been hypothesized that this may be a play behavior. And one specific source that I saw suggested that it's possible what they were trying to do is they're trying to hitch a ride on the boats. And that's why a lot of the rudders <laughs> and the and the things are breaking is they're trying to bite onto them so they can get pulled along like a skateboarder holding onto the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> what would you call that? Skitching? Skitching. It's skitching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is my yeah. favorite. Orca skitching is my new favorite behavior. I hope it's that <laughs> wholesome and fun. I really do. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it's possible, like one hypothesis is that they're skitching, they're trying to catch a ride, but many believe this is due to uh, retaliation for traumatization uh, that may have happened to one single orca belonging to a pod. The most interesting part of all of this, I think, is, you know, we know humans do horrible things and all that. And that's not really the, the interesting part here. The interesting part is that we talked about fads and how within pods, within these social structures, these orcas will teach these fads to other people. We talked about the matriarchal systems and how like the the older female in the pod started wearing a dead salmon and teaching all this stuff it appears that orcas in these pods in particular are teaching each other how to attack these boats and they're getting better at it this is wild yes so at the time of this writing they have sunk in three boats but have encountered at least 505 separate vessels in the area since 2020 just so you all know it's like this is this is how big this thing is. The attacks are increasing rapidly over the past several weeks and there are no signs of the slowing down. This is not something that has like, they're like, okay, it's kind of, there's a lull here. It's not really happening yet. They're just getting started. They're just getting started. The party is just starting. And as we said, because this seems to be learned and they tend to be learned within a group, observers have been able to identify two primary groups who have started to take this on after the initial trend began. One pod made up of juveniles and another of varying ages and one adult. It does seem to be that it's largely juveniles who are attacking these boats, which maybe makes the sketching make more sense, yes. but that is something that they're doing. Just like what we've got going on in the humans, so the, these orcas, they're on TikTok, they picked up this boat attack challenge from TikTok, and so <laughs> now the adults are involved, it'll probably start to die down. There'll be less, <laughs> less boat attacks, because they, they don't want to do the old people around. It's going to go the way of Facebook. You know how Facebook is. So now, um, yeah. kind of where the all to start, the one adult that's involved in this lovingly named white gladys which is great because orcas are mostly black color patterned yeah white gladys may be the orca that started the trend to begin with and it's currently believed that white gladys was entangled in a fishing net or some type of or had some type of negative encounter with a boat it isn't believed that these are revenge orcas per se but they're highly protective orcas so it's not that they're like seeking out justice and revenge and retribution but what they're seeing is kind of this danger and they're going nope not again. We're protecting White Gladys and the juveniles are going and attacking. And so basically what they're saying is the boats are a danger to them. So they're getting rid of the danger. And I think from like a logical standpoint, that makes sense. Yeah. Reasonable hypothesis. Yeah. Probably more evidence for that than the sketching, but I would, I would love it to be the sketching. You know? I really <laughs> hope it's the sketching like that. I hope it's yeah. that simple. I really do. Yeah. It's currently believed that at least 15 separate orgas are involved in the attacks. And again, these are from the two groups above or about six subgroups across those pods, those main pods. But here's an important thing to remember. Orcas live anywhere from 50 to 90 years, so they're not terribly far off from where humans are. Right, right. And so if, if this behavior continues and is taught across pods and to younger generations, this could be something we are seeing for a very long time if they just <laughs> yes. keep attacking people's boats. And I do think it's worth pointing out that it doesn't seem like Orcas are doing this to deliberately hurt humans, partially because, as I heard someone else pointing out elsewhere, humans would be very easy prey for orcas. Yes. Like, very easy. We can't swim fast. We can't see them coming. We're really bite-sized for them. Like, we're, we're actually pretty much exactly the right size for a meal. So, if they, if they were out there trying to hunt us, like, they would be very easy for them to do that. And they don't. So, it doesn't seem like they're trying to do this to specifically harm humans because they would do that thing if they wanted to do that thing. I have not at this point in time seen any um any evidence that orcas have ever like decided to eat a human. 
I think that the situations that have like involved human deaths have been a whole number. There's a whole host of reasons, but in each of those situations, especially the ones that happened with the trainers at SeaWorld, like the orcas didn't eat them. Yeah. So they were not like a tasty treat for them, which is actually kind of nice to think about that there's a lot of animals out in the world that don't want to eat us. Right. Since everything in Florida wants to kill us, <laughs> all the animals that is. Yeah. And the politicians, I guess. Yeah. Alligators, DeSantis, same thing. I think it's worth kind of diving into a little bit of the science here. And we've, and we've shown some of the behavioral science around this, but there's a lot to unpack within this. And, and we are not marine biologists, despite the fact that I wanted to be one, because this is a developing story. The thing that it comes back to is that scientists cannot agree on why this is occurring. They know that behavior gets taught. They know enough about orca behaviors to know that they attack and they work in pods. They work in groups. They are the wolves of the sea. We know that stuff. We know they're powerful creatures. We know they play. We know all of those things, but we don't know why this is happening. And from a parsimonious standpoint, it, it makes sense that an organism can observe another and discover new skills in this observational learning piece. But it makes sense, but it doesn't happen very often in the animal world. That's what makes kind of humans stand out compared to other animals in the world. But I think it's just really fascinating right now that like scientists are like, we have no idea why this is happening. Yeah, but... Another thing that we can sort of speculate on here that does make sense within the context of how we understand behavior to occur is that if we think of the hypothesis that perhaps what's happening here is that boats are just seen simply as a threat. If an orca got tangled up in a net or was hit by a boat or whatever was the situation that may have triggered this, and then boats immediately become symbolically representative of danger, then it makes sense for that image of a boat then to be sort of a generalized cue for danger for orcas. They're not necessarily distinguishing like that one boat did this, but that boat belongs to a class of things that all look very similar that we should now regard as being a threat. And it's well within reason to think that an organization that can recognize danger and, uh, you know, an organization, a pod in this case, a group of, of animals or individuals, if they can recognize danger, that'll do what it can to eliminate that danger. So given that orcas are these apex predators, danger is something that they would not be used to and likely would just not tolerate. As soon as there is some kind of cue of danger, they're going to organize around eliminating that threat, particularly if it's an area where they are currently relying on food, an area for mating, an area where they hang out with their other homies, like they're <laughs> going to protect that space. If we want to get into like some of the other ways to think about this too, a boat as a cue for certain behaviors could exist for rewards as well. If they're if you're talking about skitching, yeah. then hey, look, hey, there's there's the like they're scoping out. It's it's like surfers finding those tasty waves, man. <laughs> like you know the cues for it, right? Like you know the waves that are going to be good and the ones that aren't. Like I know that I can hitch a ride on this boat, and there's sometimes where I can't, and that's kind of another thing to think about too. Is that Basically, what's happening is whether these are attacks, these are aggressive attacks or these are play attacks, whatever it is, the boats are serving as a cue for this behavior to occur in this particular area. And it's not across every single pod. It's across these pods within this particular region of the world. Right. Yeah. Again, making it sort of this unique, almost cultural thing that they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the fad. They're the trendsetters. And we'll see if it if it transfers over. I mean, there's only 50,000 orcas, and the first one that makes it viral on TikTok is going to really mess up a lot of boats. That's right. <laughs> but they'll be rolling then in those, uh, in those advertiser dollars. So Hey, and uh, so are we. We have some more other interesting sort of tidbits going on here. According to sciencefocus.com, a single orca would win a fight with a great white shark. Why? Because orcas are bigger, faster, and smarter, and they hunt in packs. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's kind of difficult to understand why we're so afraid of sharks when these orcas exist. They actually scare great white sharks, so you'd think that they should be more scary to people, and they are very scary to me, to be fair. But... One of the things that I saw relevant to this is that, yeah, one of the trends is that certain pods will hunt these great whites. And as I was saying, the, the great white sharks tend to, they're loners. They tend to sort of go out on their own and they, you know, they basically eat anything that they see rather than working together cooperatively. I can say that word. <laughs> Orcas work together, as we were saying. They're very social. And so they hunt in these pods and they'll, they'll uh, surround sharks. They'll screw with them, the, you know, uh, toy with them a little bit. 
And then I've even, one of the thing, uh, sources that I found on this is they were describing, as I mentioned earlier, this thing where if they caught a great white, they would like take a bite and pass it to the next orca who would take a bite and pass it to the next orca. And they'd have this, they'd share their food, this big sort of sherry festival of eating shark guts yeah. that they... <laughs> <laughs> that seemed to be this like social affair. And Jared food is also kind of a very unique thing that you don't see all that often in the animal kingdom, except among like parents and their young. Yeah. Sometimes just like hang out in a group, sharing a meal is not something that you see very often. So that, that was kind of astonishing. And you were saying too, like one of the things they do is they figured out basically like, it's not that they're like ramming the sharks and doing that. One of the things they figured out how to do is like roll the shark over. Oh yeah, right? that's right. Like, weren't they doing that? They were rolling them over and like doing like all kinds of stuff to really like <laughs> to really mess with the sharks. Yeah, they, they'd force it into sort of when the shark got flipped over, it seemed to trigger some kind of paralysis-like state, making it easy for the orcas to tear into it, which seems Smeen. terrifying from the point of view <laughs> of the shark. Yeah, also just mean. The other thing that I forgot to mention was that they would do these things where they would like karate chop the shark. Yes, basically. So their tails, if you see them, are flat like a whale's. Yes. As you imagine them. I mean, they lay horizontally. So they would turn them sideways and they would like get like an angled dig at the shark and like puncture a hole in it. And there was even like I saw some pictures of people where they had uh, a shark body that washed up on shore and specifically the orcas had taken out the liver. Uh, they went like Hannibal Lecter on the on the shark and the, they were eating their livers, which they apparently really like as shark liver is a thing. Yeah. <sighs> This is what I'm saying. They're so scary. Orcas are so scary. Yeah. There was a really cool study. McKellar et al. in 2022 published a study that focused on using behavioral skills training to teach trainers that worked with orcas skills to improve orca attending behavior, basically attending to a task, attending to a stimulus and stuff like that. And in the study, they were actually doing discrete trial training with orcas. They were running trial after trial after trial with orcas and, and getting them to attend to certain cues and attend to certain trainers during these training sessions and were highly successful during this time. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. I've got to ask about this one since you put this together. What is going on with orcas experiencing menopause? They actually go through a period of menopause. So as they get older and they age, they go through similar like kind of like reproductive cycles that humans do. Their menstrual cycles and all that are a little bit different. Their pregnancies are a little bit different and all that, but they're mammals and they do experience towards the end of their life cycle. They do experience menopause. Wow. Yeah. I thought that was super fascinating. They start drinking wine and picking out their favorite uh, news anchor host <laughs> to watch. Yeah. I, I would imagine that the hot flashes are probably really helpful for uh, like being in cold waters. They're probably like, okay with that. Sorry, I don't mean that to be a sexist comment. I was mostly joking about people that I know who've experienced menopause, and that seems to be a thing that happened. Yes, yes, yes. It could be anybody. Anybody could get this way. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, SeaWorld dis discontinued its orca breeding program as of March 17th, 2016. This was followed on the heels of some controversy surrounding the death of some trainers, as well as the documentary Blackfish that we mentioned. And so there was definitely some things that indicated that, I mean... As you were sort of saying, for orcas, this is like being kept in a very small prison where they have almost like they're being kept in solitary confinement because they have so little opportunities to interact with others, right. even though they're these, these very highly social creatures. So while this may have seemed like a good decision after the deaths of trainers, some are concerned that it will severely limit research opportunities to learn more about the species because, as we said, although there were these considerations around how the orcas were treated. Also, SeaWorld did fund these efforts that led to research and awareness and and generally learning a lot of important things about orcas. And so many folks don't realize that SeaWorld is active in many conservation and research areas while simultaneously trying to engage in uh, entertainment opportunities. And so I do understand the concern about exploitation. I do understand, I think, the treatment of these animals and what that meant for them as a species. I also think it's it's just... It's not as black and white as the orcas are. <laughs> it's more like a type C orca. It's more of a type C orca. Yeah, there's just some gray in here because it's like, yeah, we we don't have to agree with everything that they've done to agree with some of the things that they've done. You know what I mean? And we yeah. don't have to disagree with all the things that they've done to agree with some of the things that they've done. We aren't defending SeaWorld. Good on them for making change because that was something we can hope for. And when we when we know better, we have to do better. So there's just it's nuanced. You know, that yeah. may be a missed opportunity for some more learning to happen on our end, and if that maybe had to come at the sacrifice of them giving up their breeding program, which was not something that we should have done anyway. And that's kind of like a, a thing that, that I wanted to really emphasize here is that, like, you know, 
the programs at SeaWorld, I would argue that SeaWorld's programs for conservation and some of the work they were doing were better than a lot of the other programs, at least like some of the things that they were doing and trying to put out, because you had other programs, like other like aquatic theme parks that did not have the same protections, did not have the same research opportunities. They There was a lot more exploitation on a, on a, lo- a lot less of a grand scale. And so you're finding that, you know, SeaWorld is kind of now hopefully leading the charge for changing those conditions and, and working and improving those conservation efforts and getting creative with those research opportunities that are sorely needed to protect the species. Because again, there are only 50,000 of them in the world and we need to make sure that the, those populations continue to bloom. So again, it's nuanced. It's a, it's a it's a larger discussion for what this means overall for the species and for humans working with the species. Absolutely. I do have a few more fun little things that I found. One was that as we sort of talked about them going on to beaches to hunt as a thing that they do, apparently this is something that they specifically teach their young in many instances is that mothers will push their calves onto these beaches so the calves start to learn how to sort of flop and wiggle to get themselves back out into the water uh-huh. uh, because that's what they have to do once they've gone onto shore to catch their prey. They'll get up on these beaches, they'll grab their prey, and then they'll basically sort of flop back out into the water. I mean, so they start teaching that from an early age yes, so that they have it as a hunting technique, which I thought was kind of wild. Have you ever seen videos of that? Have you ever seen that? Like what like what that looks like? I saw like a thumbnail of a video. I didn't actually end up watching the video. It is really impressive, but it's very scary. Like like it's it basically it, they they charge at the beach. They're not like they're not like creeping up onto the beach. They are they are like flying at this beach. Yeah. It's like they come bursting out of a wave and then just grab a seal and then like flop back into the water and that's when they start sharing their food. It's it's really it's intense. Man, another one that I found that was kind of interesting is that orcas have what look like reunions. And there was actually just at the at the time of this recording a few weeks ago, they reported the largest reunion they'd ever seen that lasted longer than any reunion they'd ever seen. They call them reunions because these are pods that they they'll come into contact with each other after not having seen each other for a long time. And according to this one researcher I was reading, they said that essentially they'll line up They'll create a line facing each other across like a 300 foot stretch of water. They're floating in this formation, sort of elbow to elbow, if you will, peck to peck. And they just hover there, not making any sounds, just like sort of looking at each other like they're greeting silently or something. And then after a few minutes, then they they basically party. They swim at each other. They're flopping around. They rush and break rank and swim around each other. They're slapping their tails together. They're jumping out of the water breach and rolling around. And the, again, it doesn't seem to have any other function other than the social engagement piece. And the one that I saw on the news said that, like, sometimes they'll do this. It'll go on for a few hours and it's you know, a couple of pods. But this one, they saw like six pods come together and they went for like 12 hours, basically having the biggest orca party ever, like a rave. You know, they were just <laughs> playing and playing and playing for so long. They said they'd never seen anything quite like it. It's really, it's so fun though. Like, I feel like that's such a fun thing to think about that they're like, right. They're getting together and they're like, Hey, nice to see you again. Ah!" Like, and just really like enjoying their company. I love that. Yeah. Super fun. So anyway, those are some of the interesting things that I saw about orcas, but uh, anything else you have to say about orcas? I think they're incredible creatures, and I think I'm really excited to see what they discover about this kind of new thing, these boat attacks, and what it means for kind of understanding our place in the world and how impactful we can be with these species that that we are coexisting with. I think that's just a, it's just a really fascinating thing to me. Yeah, I mean, I think if we use humans, all we really have is ourselves as a, a template against which to compare social behavior. Although we've seen social behavior in other species, of course, but we are often looking at, does this look like something we do? And therefore, is it something unique? Because humans do a lot of things that are very unique relative to other species of animals. And so we look at this and this is like, this looks closer to what humans do than a lot of what other social behaviors we see across other species. Where I'm going with this, I think, is that understanding like why they do this, we kind of have to speculate a little bit because we just don't see other creatures who are as sensitive to social circumstances as humans are, and as these orcas seem to be, where what their behavior is motivated by is social interaction. Right. Like that's a huge amount of what 
humans do. There's the we have these traditions, we have our groups, our little tribes, we have our families, we have family structures, we have societal roles that we all play, and it's gotten incredibly, incredibly complex among humans. But orcas also seem to have this. They have these little tribes, they have their families, they have their hierarchies, they have their roles, and then they hang out with other tribes and they like party and have fun <laughs> together. Yeah. And they like interact and like this the social world seems very rich and fulfilling for them and it's kind of you know fun to think about like well when we have people who go to parties what's going on with their behavior why are they choosing the things that they choose and a lot of that we can understand relatively easily like we can break down a lot of what's going on because we can ask people we can talk to them which, <laughs> right. we can like directly go in there but then we see these sort of similar things with orcas and we're like man what is going on for that what do they get out of this you know <laughs> right. it seems like we have to assume at least on the surface some of it is similar like there's some amount of like i imagine there's some like i'm going to hook the the old orc is like i'm going to hook up my daughter with this this uh this good orc Work of son over from this pod and like they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna end up they're with dowries and sh- yeah exactly <laughs> and trying to set each other up or just play and just have fun and all that so anyway without speculating too much on the specific topographies of their behavior and the functions of those behaviors i think it's suffice it to say that we sort of look at humans as a bit of an analog just because we can but not necessarily because it's the most accurate but it is still really fascinating nonetheless just cuz it's so it's so uncommon in many other species. Yes, absolutely. I think and I think it's the best way to put it. I couldn't I couldn't have summed it up better myself. Lovely. Well, in that case, if you're joining us for the first time, one of the things that we do when we're wrapping up an episode is leave you with something actionable that you can do. And that is to check out something that we found fun and enjoyable and think that you might also find fun and enjoyable. And we call that recommendations. But before we get to recommendations, it's important to acknowledge that if you would like to support the show, you can, as I said, at the top of this episode, go over where it says, you know, how many stars would you give this episode? And you just go ding, 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 all the way up to five and you click that. And then you can leave a review if you would wish, if you have time, talk about how it's the greatest podcast you've ever heard and it changed your life or, you know, whatever thing, you know, just comes speak from the heart uh, about how great everything is <laughs> make sure you subscribe so that our podcasts are always showing up brand new for you every week that we come uh, we put out new episodes every wednesday and then also uh as i said you can uh, pick up some merch at our merch store we've got hats and jackets and water bottles and all kinds of good stuff over there you also can join us on patreon and on patreon you get behind the scenes episodes ad free episodes all this extra content and there's some people who have already done that and one of the things you also get when you join us on patreon is a vocal an- acknowledgement from us every show. And so I'd like to thank Mike M, Megan, Layla, Mike T, Justin, Kim, Joshua, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, and Brian for all of your support. Thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here with us and all that you have contributed to to us and our mission and what we're doing. And so you you too can have your name read in that list of people if you go over to patreon.com slash WWD podcast and check check that out there. Yes. In addition, I need to thank the team of people who help make this show happen writing research and fact checking by Shane, Jess and myself, production and editing by Justin and then our social coordinator is Emma Wilson. Thank you all very much. Thank you for recording with me today Shane and all yeah. that you do. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad. Yeah, this was fun. Anything that I missed or anything you'd like to add before we get to those fun fun recommendations? No, I think that covers it. Awesome. Recommendations. I discovered a documentary on Netflix, and you know, I feel like I'm not going to say this is the greatest documentary ever. However, I feel like it's very particular, and uh, I'm somebody who is just like very, really fascinated, like very, very particular things. And this was one of them. It's called Muscles and Mayhem: An Unauthorized Story of American Gladiators. Did you watch American Gladiators growing up? A little bit, yeah. I don't remember it very well though. It is a wild time. So most of what everybody remembers is like you had these big like athletic people that had like very like one syllable names like Blaze and uh, uh, Sky and uh, all that stuff. Right. And then you had a couple that had two Nitro Laser. They were all like really tough sounding, very 90s names. Sure. It's a six episode series that interviews the original gladiators and like some some other folks that came up and how the show came to be, how it became kind of this like weird 90s like phenomenon. It kind of dives very briefly into Crash TV, which was like kind of in the 90s was like all the stuff that where reality TV was like really 
terrible mm-hmm. and on all the things like that's what it was it's basically just like not just in the 90s yeah yeah exactly it's kind of continued and they were saying like it's just all the criticisms and stuff around it and how unsafe it was uh, and oh, when you really think yeah, about uh, american gladiators you're like putting people who are not athletes up against people who are athletes on activities that are not well thought out and people were getting hurt all the time thanks it's a really fascinating kind of like like glimpse into the 90s it's from like 1989 for seven seasons up through like 95 i think it was is when they finished it up and um it was just a super interesting unique look at this time frame that i remember so fondly because i was so obsessed with that i was like i want to get in one of those steel balls and roll around uh, i want to do the eliminator i wanted to do those things and um it's a, it's super super interesting and also just a really interesting glimpse in, glimpse into hollywood and how terrible it is sure so, yeah that so, sounds like fun <laughs> yeah it's great all right and you said this the documentary is a like six episode series you were saying it's a six episode limited series on netflix right now got it okay yeah fun well, i'm also recommending a tv series i don't know if this is going to get a second season kind of hard to imagine how it could but it's a series called jury duty this is from free v and is on available on amazon prime for those of you who like to watch that It's sort of like reality TV meets prank show meets sitcom in a way. Sure. A lot of improv comedy. The premise of the show, without giving really anything away, because I think you need to know this going in, otherwise you may not (laughs) like it. You might think this is, you know, not as funny as it is or it's crazy. I don't know. Anyway, is that a bunch of actors and improv comedians get together to basically stage a trial and they get a guy off Craigslist for jury duty for this trial. And so he shows up thinking it's a real trial and it's real jury duty that he's doing because he's been summoned for jury duty or like been, has been asked to come for jury duty. Sure. And specifically the recruitment was like, Oh, we're, we're filming this documentary about how juries work. I think was how they said, how they justified having all the cameras there and everything. And so he's sort of showing up thinking, well, this is going to be, you know, a really boring thing, but there'll be all these cameras and they're just shooting like what it's like to do jury duty. And so that's why he sort of volunteered for it, I think is, is what happened anyway. So they set up all these beats and skits they wanted to have happen along the way. Then they, they engage him, this guy who is unsuspecting thinking this is all real. And they go through and they said, they specifically had to arrange days where like almost nothing would happen. They'd show up and there'd just be like eight hours of very little going on because that's what jury duty can be sometimes. Right. Right. And so they'd only keep, of course, the parts they filmed that were meant to be sort of fun for the show. Um, But they had scripted in all these interactions to take place. But if the guy, like they couldn't predict what he was going to do necessarily. So they had some sort of, if this happens, then do this. But if this happens, then do this. And then sometimes they just had to go completely off script and make it up as they went. And, um, (laughs) Included some very eccentric characters in it. And anyway, James Marsden is in it. He plays sort of a very Hollywood elite douchey version of himself. (laughs) And so (laughs) anyway, again, don't want to give too much away, but the show is just absolutely hilarious. It's so funny. It's so well done. It's super engaging. So what what you might hear about this and maybe maybe not want to watch is like prank shows can be really hard to watch because you're like watching someone like have a bad day and get upset and like that can suck. Anyway, they really don't, they handle it very nicely in this one. They, when they do the big reveal and they're really like, they're really kind, you know, they really treat the guy like, Hey, you are such a good sport about this. You know, thank you really for being along here. So there's a big reveal, which I think is actually, again, I don't want to spoil it, but you need to know that going in. Cause otherwise you might be like this poor guy <laughs> that they did this too. It's not like a mean, like heartless prank, right? Yes. It is not mean. Anyway, I strongly recommend go check out jury duty. I love that. That's so good. I spent as much time talking about that as I did talking about why it's interesting to learn about whales. I think. <laughs> but uh, that's where we're at. All right. Well, if you'd like to tell us about TV shows that you are watching that are like documentaries on various streaming platforms, we're always open to hearing those things. If there's something you'd like to add about orca behavior, what we missed or what you'd like to comment on or just tell us how great of a job we did, you should certainly do that. You can reach out to us directly by emailing us at info at WWD, WWD podcast. We're active on all the other social media platforms and we really want to hear from everybody who is who is there so i think that that is all that i have anything that i missed or anything you'd like to add before we wrap up here no i think that covers it perfect all right then thank you for listening this is abraham and this is shane we're out see ya you've been listening to why we do what we do you can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com thanks for listening and we hope you have an awesome day